Hey, students, this is Professor Gore, and <clears throat> you can ignore the chapter number. This corresponds to a different uh, textbook than the one you're using. But uh, this recorded lecture is um, about a huge chunk of the Vietnam War. It's not about the whole thing, because uh, we'll get to some of the rest of the ending of the Vietnam War when we get to Nixon's presidency. But I do want to talk about the bulk of the war under LBJ's presidency and really was LBJ's downfall. So um, as I mentioned previously, LBJ had campaigned on the idea that he was going to keep us out of um, sending more troops over to Vietnam War because Kennedy had sent, he raised them out from about 800 or 900 from the Eisenhower administration to about 3,200 or so. And then his last year in office, he raised it to about a little over 16,000. And so when LBJ uh, serves really the last year of Kennedy's term in 1964, um, he had ran in that campaign of the 1964 election that, you know, he didn't want to send American boys to fight a war that Asian boys ought to be fighting. So, um, but he ends up uh, pledging to support South Vietnam and then ends up escalating the war and really kind of uh, sold the public on, on what the opposite of what his intentions were. And so here's a, a quote he gave at a speech where he was speaking to college students at John Hopkins University. So he was asked, why are we in South Vietnam? And he says, we're there because we have a promise to keep. Since 1954, every American president has offered to support the people of South Vietnam. We have helped to build and we have helped to defend. Thus, over many years, we have made a national pledge to help South Vietnam defend its independence. He also says, I intend to keep our promise to dishonor that pledge, to abandon the small, brave nation to its enemy, to the terror that must follow would be an unforgivable wrong. We are there to strengthen world order. Okay. Around the globe from Berlin to Thailand are people whose well-being rests in part on the belief they can count on us if they are attacked. To leave Vietnam to its fate would shake the confidence of all these people in the value of American commitment, and the result will be increased unrest and instability or even war. So, but... What ends up happening is Johnson said that, uh, said that he didn't want to send us into another war, uh, but actually he was looking for a reason to have an excuse to send troops over into war. So while conducting reconnaissance um, missions off the coast of North Vietnam, the U.S. destroyer Maddox was apparently fired upon. Now, if you get a chance to watch the Ken Burns documentary on the Vietnam War, which is great, um, it's too long for me to have you guys watch it. And it is intense in places for sure. Um, basically, what uh, the USS Maddox weren't even sure it was attacked, but it thought it was attacked and uh, said that basically North Vietnam provoked this conflict. Now, Ho Chi Minh said that he didn't want that um, and was, was angered to hear that a potential North Vietnamese vessel might have had a run in with an American naval vessel. So what ends up happening is Congress um, gives what is called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Um, and in that resolution, which the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, you want to take notes on, put a star on, underline, in case you have it on a quiz or a test. It basically gave the president blank check powers, basically a blank check of how much money you can use to spend to stop the spread of communism in South Vietnam and use any force you deem necessary. OK, now, if you look at troop levels in 1964, the first full year Johnson is in office. The troop levels have risen from when Kennedy was last in office, just over 16,000, to now 23,300. Of course, the Arvin troops, which are South Vietnamese troops, are at 514,000. And so, um, but let's look at when the war is going to be Americanized. So the war had been going on uh, as a civil war between the North and the South um, since the 50s, Okay, since no DM refused to allow um reunification elections because most likely he would have lost uh, against Ho Chi Minh. And then later, um, Le Zuan is going to be the leader of really the guy calling the shots in the Vietnam War. And does, he does some controversial things himself. But what ends up happening is after the Gulf of Tonkin, Tonkin Resolution was passed, um, the United States is going to commit to fighting for South Vietnam. So not just sending in weapons, uh, military supplies, and not just sending in military advisors um, who are advising the, the Arvin troops how to fight, but now they're actually going to be fighting themselves, really starting in 1965. And so um, the escalation, which was accomplished in the early months of 1965, took two forms, deployment of American ground troops and intensification of bombing against North Vietnam. And the, the U.S. government, uh, its military is going to drop more bombs, 
on North Vietnam that was dropped on Germany, Italy, and Japan combined during World War II, if that tells you how many bombs were dropped. By 1966, more than 380,000 American soldiers were stationed in Vietnam, and by 1967, there were 485,000, and by 1968, 536,000, um, and so forth. It does expand presidential power with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And we look at look back on it today, and historians are like, you know, Johnson, this was a clear misstep uh, in his presidency. And so I'm going to show you several maps that shows you um, um, aspects of, of South Vietnam. I want to take note of this. Okay, so here's North Vietnam. You notice its border to China. So if you remember in the Korean conflict, when American forces got close to the Yalu River, okay, China invaded and drove American forces back. So if the U.S. decides to do a full-scale invasion of North Vietnam, what can you assume would most likely happen if it tried to conquer all of North Vietnam? Well, you can assume that China would, re -in would invade just like they had done with North Korea and drive the American forces back because they have overwhelmingly numbers of military personnel. Um, and so, you know, would Johnson drop an atomic bomb on China? You know, that's, that's something that that's a discussion that they weren't wanting to have. And so um, what's happening is North Vietnam is getting military weapons from China and the Soviet Union. So um, there's two forces that the Arvin, anytime you hear me say Arvin, I'm talking about South Vietnam. Um, it's military, okay, that was backing the democratic government of South Vietnam. Now, granted, there wasn't always really fair democracy there, but that's beside the point. And then the other one is commonly called the Viet Cong, like the National Liberation Front. These are South Vietnamese communist okay so the Viet Cong are South Vietnamese communist okay and then the NVA is North Vietnamese army okay so I, I know it's confusing because you're talking about the NVA and the Viet Cong and then also the Arvin which was on the outside of the United States and so forth so the North Vietnamese forces are getting supplies from China and the Soviet Union the hard part is getting them down in the North South Vietnam because American forces have the de demilitarized zone blocked off so what they would do is they would go in through North Rural Laos and Cambodia and then bring them into Viet Cong forces. And then as the NVA increasingly, North Vietnamese Army increasingly moves and operates in here, then um, there's going to be conflict. OK. And so um, there's going to be uh, attacks at, at, at various times in different parts of the country. So the Ho Chi Minh Trail, definitely want to know what that is. This is where North Vietnamese troops supplied the Viet Cong or other North Vietnamese troops already there uh, through neutral Laos and Cambodia. Okay. Now later the United States at the end of the war under the Nixon administration is going to go into Laos and Cambodia and they did so without congressional approval and that's going to be controversial. Now eventually the Arvin will invade without the U.S. support towards the end of the war for the U.S. Um, and the U.S. doesn't go with them. Okay. Because Congress said no. Uh, you can see all these different uh, places. These are um, conflicts that happen. Now, what's hard about um, the Vietnam uh, War, okay, this is one thing you have to understand why uh, Vietnam, our, our Vietnam War veterans um, suffered from such high rates of, of, of post-traumatic stress disorder, is who was the enemy, okay? Because particularly Viet Cong would be villagers by the daytime, you know, waving at you and uh, offering you help and so forth. And then at night, they're running operations to kill you. And it was very uh, stressful to figure out who the enemy was. I mean, the other thing, too, is strategically, um, the American um, strategy is, is what's called body counts. So anytime there's an engagement, they want to uh, kill as many of the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese Army as they can and then count the number of bodies that they have killed. And so they thought if they dropped X amount of bombs, if they did X amount of operations, and of course, X is supposed to be some random number, um, then they would eventually wear down the Viet Cong, eventually wear down the North Vietnamese Army, and they would eventually sue for peace. That's actually not what happens. Um, instead, for everyone you kill, it ends up more rise up and so forth. And, and there were innocent people in these South Vietnamese villages who were targeted and unfairly punished because the Viet Cong, it was so difficult to tell who was who. Uh, and so that provides challenges for the Arvin forces and the American forces. And if you look in 1965, the year that the uh, U.S. Air Force base at Pleiku was attacked, uh, now the United States has upped its level. So here Johnson had said the year before, we're not going to send American boys to fight a war. Asian boys ought to be fighting. Well, look at that. 
23,000 to drop uh, shoots up to 184,000. That Gulf of Tonkin resolution definitely went into effect. Now, the Arvin forces have increased. And now also you have a few forces from other countries, even South Korea, because they were all part of CEDO, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization Pact, and that plus support. They didn't do as much, though, as the Arvin and American forces did. And so what ends up happening is um, with the attack on the U.S. Air Force Base at Pleiku, um, the United States military begins Operation Rolling Thunder. Uh, Operation Rolling Thunder is where they just bomb the living crap out of North Vietnam. Okay. Um, and so let's go over some terminology for the Vietnam War. Uh, Landmines were primarily used for, by the Viet Cong. So you could be walking along peacefully on a road and boom, you step on a landmine, you're done. Okay. It, it kills uh, uh, American personnel, Arvin personnel, uh, Vietnamese civilians, children. They don't know where, where the um, landmines are. Also, um, Americans, when they bombed uh, North Vietnam, and um, they particularly bombed with American B-52 bomber planes, these massive jets that are loaded to the brim with explosives, and you just bomb the crap out of, out of, out of cities. Um, also, you have a, a bomb type called fragmentation bombs. And so whenever it uh, explodes, it throws pieces of thick metal casing in all directions. Um, anyway, they... Um, um, they did drop those uh, a lot of times on what they thought were Viet Cong or North Vietnamese Army forces, and, some, and a lot of times it did kill civilians. Agent Orange, this is something that has been outlawed internationally now. Uh, it was developed by an American chemical company. I can't remember if it was uh, Monsanto or DuPont or uh, Dow Chemical. I can't remember. One of those companies made Agent Orange, and what it is, it's like Roundup on steroids, you know, Roundup kills plants. And so um, the hard part was, is that the uh, NVA forces and Viet Cong would be hiding in the thick jungles. So uh, uh, pilots were ordered to spray this, this uh, uh, herbicide that would just basically kill all plants. And um, what, what that does, it just, it, um, it's got this dioxide in it. And so as NVA or Viet Cong forces are down in the tunnels on the ground, when that stuff gets in them, it gets into their skin. And that's why Vietnam today uh, is one of the, I think it may be lead the world in birth defects. That or um, Belarus, Ukraine from uh, Chernobyl. But and it, and it really um, impacts their offspring. And so it, anyway, it's outlawed internationally today, but it kills vegetation. Um, and it still has dev devastated some of the Vietnamese landscape. Uh, napalm is the one that's most remembered in movies, particularly Apocalypse Now. But it is a jelly-like substance that, when it explodes, it just burns uncontrollably until it burns up. And it just—that's what you see blowing up behind Forrest Gump as he's running out of the forest or out of the jungle with uh, Baba uh, to get him out of there to safety. That's napalm. Operation Rolling Thunder. This is where you start having down POWs and American uh, pilots are going to be held in uh, North Vietnamese prisons, um, POW camps, and they were not treated as POWs. And so oftentimes were tortured, starved, beaten. Uh, the, the most infamous one was what's called the Hanoi Hilton. It was in the city of Hanoi. Um, eventually, North Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese forces released them uh, in the 1970s and early 1973. Uh, but there was a lot of POWs that were never released by the NVA. And that adds controversy to the war um, because they starved or, um, you know, they um, died in these camps and they were hidden in Laos and Cambodia even. A lot of stuff that weren't really uh, on record with the Geneva uh, Convention and Accords. So here's a problem. Who is the enemy? Because you got a guerrilla fighting force. Our military in the 1960s was designed to fight another conventional military being the Soviet Union. Okay, not designed to fight guerrilla war tactics. And so here's what the Viet Cong would look like. They're not really in uniform. Um, and so, yes, they have certain helmets, but a lot of these uh, hats and so forth look similar to what uh, 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 villagers and rice paddies would be using to protect themselves in the sun. You can see these are Soviet made weapons and so forth. Also would hide in a series of um, uh, trenches and not trenches, but uh, tunnels and so forth to escape. Uh, American and Arvin forces. Now, this right here was an image that uh, appeared on national television in the United States. This is actually the police chief of Saigon. Okay, so he's supposed to be loyal to the United States. 
this guy was a um, Viet Cong spy. I think it just killed somebody. And so instead of having a trial by jury, he just took him on the side of the road and shot him in the head. And this is the image where he had just, the bullet has just entered his head. And this was on national television and Americans are horrified at seeing this. So um, by 1967, the majority of Americans disproved the war. In fact, we've never had a war in American history that had such great disapproval. Um, you look at the war in Iraq, never had the disapproval ratings the way the Vietnam War had. And so um, it leads to this rise of the anti-war movement and a lot of student activism. Uh, and so particularly a lot of college students because they were getting drafted. And so we had a draft that, that had continued from 1940 all the way through the entire Vietnam War to eventually it ends in the early 1970s. And so initially when the war started uh, in 1965, if you were going off to college, you could defer your draft status. Well, OK, who's going off to college in the, the mid and late 1960s? Well, the middle class and upper class. So those that are getting drafted who couldn't defer from it were poor rural uh, whites and other groups uh, across the country and poor minorities, particularly African-Americans uh, in cities. And so what you have is you have a disproportionate uh, number of poor people fighting the war. Now, later Nixon's going to change that, but still. Uh, and so, like, for instance, the overall African-American population, you had a higher percentage of African-American men fighting than you did of white men uh, or uh, other groups. And, and you still had Hispanics that were fighting, Native Americans that were fighting and so forth. Um, in the Vietnam War. And this free speech movement began on college campuses to basically protest the Vietnam War and um, would, would occupy uh, different um, uh, college buildings and so forth to try to get attention in, uh, to, in the protest of the war. And these are actually troops uh, or MPs that are protecting uh, um, pro or from protesters uh, at Columbia University and so forth, but they also had demonstrations numerous times at the Pentagon in D.C. And um, here's some more protesters. Now, later in the war, um, Hollywood um, actors and actresses, particularly there's only a handful, but traveled North Vietnam to, and, and opposed the war. The, the one that, that was the most infamous one to do this was Jane Fonda, uh, le daughter of legendary a uh, actor Peter Fonda, who was a legend back in the day. Well, Jane Fonda was considered this, uh, um, you know, uh, bright up and or coming beautiful actress and so forth. And she went and visited uh, in OI P POW camps in a protest of the war and said that, that American POWs should be cr uh, tried, convicted and hung for treason. Um, or for, for war crimes against me, I'm sorry, not treason. And so, uh, wow, it was extremely controversial. In fact, uh, Vietnam veterans still um, um, will speak ill of Jane Fonda, and many have not forgiven her uh, for this action because she, she kind of openly criticized American POWs, um, you know, particularly these pilots who are doing what they're ordered to do and are getting shot down, who are being starved and beaten and mistreated. Uh, and... Um, and here she is. And one of POW asked her to give something to her fam, his family. And she refused. Um, and and um, anyway, but so she has been ridiculed quite a bit uh, in the media um, and by Vietnam veterans over the years. And so I, I've heard some Vietnam veterans say, you know, hey, we need to move past this and uh, forgive and, and so forth. But her career has was not controversial until this. And then it became controversial. After. Um, and so. You also, um, the anti-war demonstrations continued to um, expand and expand as the war went along. Um, unfortunately, though, the anti-war movement got violent, and uh, typically people don't listen um, when you get violent. So like the civil rights movement that was nonviolent, it won over a lot of people in support of it. Um, the anti-war movement, um, those that remained peaceful were kind of drowned out by those that were wanted for violence. And so in 1970, when um, things were, were thrown at uh, National Guardsmen uh, at Kent State University, um, they were ordered to fire into the crowd. Four students were shot dead and 11 students were wounded. At Jackson State University in Mississippi, um, anti-war protests led to police officers uh, firing, actually they didn't fire into the crowd, but they, they fired and hit the building and it went into the dormitory and actually killed two, two uh, students there. 
And so I don't have any pictures from Jackson State. I've looked and looked. I just don't think there was any pictures of that actual event until after the fact. Uh, so I looked on the web. I uh, can't find any. Um, and so forth. So morale begins to dip, um, as particularly after 1968, the Tet Offensive, which I'll cover um, uh, a little bit later in a different lecture. And um, you began having uh, racial problems, um, particularly between officers and minorities and so forth. And, and uh, at one point, uh, an officer was murdered um, because of, of, of racism stuff that he had said towards his fellow um, soldiers under his command. Also, American troops began using drugs in high numbers. Particularly, there was a big black market drug um, thing in the, in the 60s over in Vietnam. Also, there was uh, resentment towards officers. Now, you don't see this today in American military, but um, for instance, enlisted men um, would serve for 12 months um, on the front lines and then um, so forth. But officers would serve six months on front lines and six months in the rear. And so that a lot of soldiers didn't feel like that was fair. Um, so we'll come to the counterculture movement in a different lecture, and I'm going to finish the Vietnam War uh, in a later lecture as well. We'll talk about the Tet Offensive, how that uh, changes forever the course of the American of the war in Vietnam, how what happens when um, at least to, to Johnson um, signed to not for run for re-election, and then Nixon coming into office and how Nixon handles the Vietnam War. So we're not done with the Vietnam War. We're um, we're going to take a pause and we'll come back to that in a different lecture.